Hey, good morning. It's Mark. Got a, uh, a short thought for you today, and that's this. Let's say you're the uh, leader of a medical group. It could be a, uh, a small group, but you could be a solo practitioner. Uh, or you could be the, the president and CEO of a 600 or 6,000 provider group. It doesn't make any difference. Here's the point. You negotiated for some arrangement. Uh, this could be a, um, an agreement with a payer. It could be an agreement with a facility. Uh, it could be an agreement with almost anyone. It, that doesn't make any difference either. And then six months later, again, the time doesn't make any difference. Someone, whether it's your deal partner or a third party, approaches you with another agreement. Now, this could be as simple as in the most um, direct case, um, some request for an amendment to the original deal. Or it could uh, be as um, obtuse, perhaps, uh, as um, uh, being approached by a third party who also has dealings with uh, that first entity that you're dealing with, the one that you have the agreement with. And this third party proposes um, some other deal with you, some other arrangement. You have to ask yourself how entering into a seemingly benign amendment, how entering into a seemingly benign other arrangement, uh, even with a third party, will impact that first, that first deal. Oftentimes this is forgotten. It's not considered, it's viewed as standalone. But many times, especially with the complexities of healthcare dealings, and the, compl the complexity of healthcare compliance, those other deals have a tremendous impact on your initial arrangement. So you can't look at these arrangements as standalone. You have to go back, even if they're seemingly disconnected, and look at the impact. If not, you can screw up years of planning. You can screw up the terms of an agreement. You could find yourself uh, now bound to terms that you had no idea you were being bound to. So it pays, like in carpentry, uh, to uh, measure twice and cut once.